Greetings, George Nachuk. Today I'm going to talk about parallax methods. Uh, this subject has been coming up uh, lately in some discussion groups that I've had and uh, there seems to be some confusion regarding what parallax measurements are. And I'm going to go through um, uh, some basics here that will take you from um, how to measure uh, distances to an object into the parallax methods and we'll end up with a very simple form at the end. Uh, somewhere in between uh, the mathematics might scare you. It's not all that difficult. It's going to be some trigonometry, a little bit of algebra, but don't let it scare you because the result at the end is going to be very simple where you can make a, a simple angle measurement and just apply some arithmetic to get the distance to an object, a distant object. So, first, what is parallax? Parallax is the apparent shift of an object with respect to its background when an ob observer changes his position. For example, suppose you have an object that's out in the distance, and you're going to sight that object with respect to the background. Let's say you could very easily demonstrate this in a room. Uh, if you put up uh, uh, a scale on a far wall, it doesn't even have to be a scale, you can just have some objects in the room, uh, but the scale will easily demonstrate for you. And between the scale and you, the observer, there's some object that you want to determine the distance to. For example, if you take your hand and extend your arm out and hold your finger, then what you do is say cover your left eye, then take this finger and sight it on an object uh, on a distant wall in your room or outside, say to a tree or a car or something, and then once you have it sighted up in line with the object in the uh, far distance, then close your right eye and look through your left and you'll see that the background with respect to your finger seems to change and that's parallax. What's going on there is if you have two positions, this could be your left eye, your right eye and the distance between a few inches and you're sighting an object. So we first close our left eye and we sight the object to something in the distance. And here we see the object, which could be your finger, and it's sighted up to number three on the scale. Then what you do is you close the um, right eye and look through the left. And now what you'll be seeing is the object will appear to have shifted with respect to the background. Now, looking through the left eye, we see the number one on the scale. So, shifting from the right eye to the left eye, we see the object shifting with respect, and that is called parallax. Now, if we know the change in position that the observer makes and measure that length, which we call the baseline, that is, the observer is going to change change position, we go from position 1 to position 2, and this length between position 1 and position 2 is called the baseline, so we'll call it LB for the length between the uh, two positions in which the observer um, looks at the object. And if we measure the angle that the sight, line of sight to the object makes with the baseline, at each of the two endpoints, one and two here, we have enough information to geometrically determine and solve for the lengths of all sides of the triangle defined by the observer's position and the object. So this triangle, geometric triangle, we can see that we have it here, is defined by the baseline between the two points of observation and the object. These are the vertices of the triangle. And we measure the baseline angles. We have, let's call alpha 1, 
and alpha 2. These are the angles that the baseline makes with the line of sight of observation to the object. We measure those two angles. And from these two angles, we can determine this angle. Call it theta. Because the sum of the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees. We have alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus theta is equal to pi. So theta then, pi is 180 degrees, pi radians are 180 degrees, so theta is pi minus alpha 1 plus alpha 2. So by measuring the baseline angles, we can determine the angle theta. Now, uh, from the uh, angles alpha 1 and alpha 2, we can determine these lengths, remaining unknown lengths of the triangle. We know LB, we know alpha 1, we know alpha 2, we have enough information to solve for L1 and L2. And the way we can do that, to solve it exactly, we use what's called the law of sines. Now, the so law of sines relate the uh, interior angles of a triangle to its side lengths. And we can write that as follows. That this length, the baseline, LB, is to the sine of the opposite angle as L1 is to the opposite angle that it sees. So as to L1 is to sine of alpha 2 as the sine of length 2 is to the opposite angle the sine of the angle alpha 1. That's the law of sines. So we can use a little bit of algebra and uh, solve for L1 and L2. This should be L2. So L1 then will L equal the baseline length LB times the sine of alpha 2 over the sine of theta. And in a similar manner, we can write that L2 is equal to the baseline length, LB, times the sine of alpha 1 over the sine of theta. So, by measuring the baseline angles, alpha 1 and alpha 2 solve for theta with this equation. We take the ratio of the two sides, uh, sines of the two angles, multiply by the baseline length, and we can determine exactly the side, the remaining two sides of that triangle. And that is the distance out to the object from each of the uh, positions of observation. Now, uh, as the viewed object gets further and further away, these angles, alpha 1 and alpha 2, approach 90 degrees, and theta approaches zero. This is an approximation, uh, well, with, with this characteristic taking place, we can make a few approximations. Now, imagine here we have our baseline, 1 and 2, and say our object's way out here. Now we can see this angle theta gets smaller and smaller as these two baseline angles approach 90 degrees. If this goes way out towards infinity, this line of sight will be like that, and this one will be like that, and it's approaching 90 degrees. So as L1 and L2 become much, much greater than the baseline length, then Alpha 1 approaches 90 degrees, or pi over 2. Alpha 2 approaches also pi over 2. And theta approaches 0. That's a characteristic that happens. This is the same sort of thing that happens with perspective. If you're down here and sighting an object uh, in the distance, this angular measure that you uh, observe of a uh, some object in the distance 
this angle gets smaller and smaller. The apparent angular measure of an object in the distance gets smaller and smaller as the length or the distance that object uh, gets from the point of observation. We're just using perspective basically reversed rather than uh, sitting out here and looking at the baseline as uh, it gets further and further away. We're maintaining a constant baseline and we're looking at an object going this way. It's, uh, just using perspective in reverse. So, what we can do now with this occurring that the baseline angles approach 90 degrees and the angle theta is approaching zero, we can make an approximation. As alpha 1 approaches pi over 2, we have, remember, for our length, L1 is equal to the baseline times the sine of alpha 2 over the sine of theta, and L2 is the baseline length times the sine of alpha 1 over sine of theta. Well, what happens as alpha 1 and alpha 2 approach pi over 2, the sine of alpha 2 and the sine of alpha 1 approach 1. That is, the sine of some angle, alpha, approaches 1 as alpha approaches pi over 2 radians or 90 degrees. So we can replace the numerator since alpha 2 is very close to 90 degrees as the object that we're observing gets further and further away, the sine of alpha 2 becomes 1. So we can put 1 in the numerator. And the same thing here. We have the baseline times 1. Now what about the denominator? Well, as theta approaches 0, the sine ha function has this property. The sine of theta approaches theta as theta approaches zero. That is, we can approximate the sine of an angle by just the angle itself, as long as the angle is re expressed in radians. Not degrees, but it has to be in radians. So, this becomes theta in radians. And this becomes theta in radians. So we notice that L1 and L2 become almost the same length. They're basically the same length as we get further and further away. And you can see that on um, the triangle here. Uh, side length 1 and side length 2 essentially are the same length as this object gets off in the distance. So L1 is equal to L2, which is the baseline, divided by the angle theta in radians. That's the approximation, and it's a very good approximation. This is the exact equation right here. This is exact, and this is approximate. Let's look to see how closely the approximate equation um, works out uh, it, with a real example. <clears throat> okay, for example, say we set up a baseline of 100 feet. So, we have a baseline here of 100 feet. That's our LB. And, say we have an object out here, we're trying to determine what its distance is. And we measure the two baseline angles to the object. We have alpha 1 and we have alpha 2, and here's our angle theta. Let's say alpha 1 we find to be 88 degrees. We can use a surveying theodolite or some other means to establish these angles and alpha 2 is 86.4 degrees. 
Then our theta in radians, remember, is pi or 180 degrees minus the sum of alpha 1 and alpha 2. And this will work out in this case to be pi minus 3.04385 radians. That's the sum of alpha 1 and alpha 2, 88 degrees plus 86.4 in radians is 30.04385. And this difference comes out to 0.09774 radians, which is 5.6 degrees. <clears throat> and our LB is 100 feet. Now, using the exact equations, L1 then is LB times the sine of alpha 2 over the sine of theta, which is 100 feet. That's our LB. The sine of alpha 2 is sine of 86.4 degrees divided by the sine of theta, which is 5.6 degrees. And this comes out to 100 feet times sine of 86.4 is 0 0.9980, and the sine of 5.6 is 0 0.09758. And this comes out to L1, in this case, will be 100, or 1,222.7 feet, which is about 0 0.1.94 miles. So, we measure um, the baseline angle alpha 1 to be 88 degrees, alpha 2 to be 86.4 with a baseline length of 100 feet, then this object is going to be a little over 1,000 feet away. In a similar manner, we find that L2 uh, is the baseline times the sine of alpha 1 over the sine of theta, and if we put the numbers in for that, we end up with L2 is 1,024.1 feet, which to three decimal places is again 1.9 or 0 0.194 miles. So here's our L1, here's our L2. Now, what about the approximate equations? Well, with the approximate equation, we see that L1 is equal to L2, which is the baseline divided by theta in radians. Well, the baseline is 100 feet divided by theta in radians, which is 0 0.09774. That's the radian measure of theta. Well, this works out to 1,023.1 feet which to three decimal places is 0 0.194 miles. Now, if we average L1 and L2, 1022.7 and 1024.1, that average comes out to 1023.4 feet. Very close to the approximation if we average L1 and L2 in this case. <clears throat> now, the, um, uh, the exact equations for L1 and L2 when averaged, of course, come out to the approximation. And you can easily show this mathematically. I'm not going to do it here, but you could use the exact equations for L1, L2, make some uh, um, uh, uh, expand the signs uh, in terms of uh, some power functions and you'll find that the average of L1 and L2 comes out very very close to the baseline divided by theta and radians. So the question we have now is how can we use parallax to measure distances to objects that are far away? Now 
The key to using a parallax method for determining our distance to the object L1 and L2 is to find an object very far away from both uh, uh, us, the observer, and the object that we're trying to determine the distance. So let's say we pick an object or a light source way off in the distance out here, way out here. It's much, much further away than the object. Now, the key point here is when we do that, the light rays coming from that very distance object appear to come to us at the observation points in parallel light rays. That is, we see at positions 1 and 2 at the ends of the baseline that the light rays are coming from the same direction, that these two light rays are parallel. That's the key point in, parallel, uh, uh, in parallax measurements. So these light rays then are coming in parallel and at the same angle with respect to the baseline where we make our angle measurement. See, this angle here going from here and if we extend the baseline and that angle there are assumed to be the same, that these line, these par line, <laughs> these light rays are parallel to one another. Uh, and so they're uh, incident on the baseline at the same angle when we're measuring uh, these angles alpha 1 and alpha 2 at the endpoints of the baseline. Now this is the same as what we had before, our alpha 1 here is the baseline angle that we measure to the object from with respect to the baseline at one end of the baseline and alpha 2 is this angle here the baseline angle that we measure at position 2 when we sight the object and it's that angle with respect to the baseline and L1 and L2 are the distances to the object from the endpoints on the baseline. That is, now we're assuming that the light rays coming from this very distance object are parallel as seen arriving from that light source or that object way, way out in the distance. Now, that being the case, note that with properties of um, transversal angles in geometry that if you have two parallel lines cut by a line that intersects them then this angle which I will call phi 1 is the same as this angle phi 1. What you have here are two parallel lines this line and this line cut by another line so that angle and that angle are the same as is this angle and this angle. That's a property of parallel lines intersected by another line uh, just using plane geometry. Now, as before, here's our angle theta and let's call this angle here beta and let's call this angle that the second parallel ray is making or when we're here in position 2 and sighting our object the angle that we measure sighting the object with respect to that light ray that's coming from way in the distance is phi 2 and the angle that we make when we sight the object from position 1 the other end of the baseline with respect to that sighting that object way in the distance we'll call phi 1. Now using properties of triangles what we have here is if we look at this triangle let me outline it here in green let's look at this triangle here so what we have this triangle, this is phi 2, this is beta, 
and this is theta. That's this triangle right here. Now, the sum of the interior angles of any triangle is 180 degrees, or if we're using radian measure, it's uh, pi. So we can say that <clears throat> um, uh, on the interior of this triangle, we can sum the interior angles, phi 2 plus theta plus beta is equal to pi. So we have phi 2 plus theta plus beta is equal to pi. Now, another property of lines intersecting is if we have two lines intersecting like this, this angle plus this angle are called supplementary angles, and they sum to 180 degrees or pi radians. And we have that right here. Beta plus phi 1 is going to be equal to pi. So beta plus phi 1 is equal to pi. So we can solve this equation for beta. Beta is equal to pi minus phi 1. And we substitute that in here. So we rewrite phi 2 plus theta. And in for beta, we put pi minus phi 1. And that is equal to pi. This part is beta. I just substitute it in. So we see that we have a pi on each side. Those cancel. We can write this as phi 2 plus theta minus phi 1 is equal to 0. And let's solve for theta. Theta is equal to phi 1 minus phi 2. So we can get theta like we did before. But instead of using the baseline angles, alpha 1 and alpha 2, we will use the parallel parallax angles. The V1 and V2 here are called the parallax angles. So before, remember, we had for theta was pi minus alpha 1 plus alpha 2, where alpha 1 and alpha 2 were the baseline angles. But now we're expressing that very same angle theta in terms of the parallel parallax angles. V1 and V2, the parallax angles, are not the same as the baseline, baseline angles. Now, the advantage of this, which is really neat, is that the parallel Parallax angles, phi 1 and phi 2, eliminates the need for you to be able to sight along the baseline in order to get the baseline angles. See, to observe the baseline angles, you have to have a clear view between the two ends of the baseline so that you can uh, get this reference line in order to measure alpha 1 and alpha 2. Well, what happens if you have an obstruction in between the ends? You can't sight the baseline. You can't see uh, this end of the baseline uh, when you're over here and vice versa. So you cannot make a determination of this reference line. So that, ends to, that becomes a problem when you're trying to measure the baseline angles. Um, now, using the parallel, parallax angles, you eliminate that problem, and you don't have to be able to sight along the baseline. All you have to know is the length of the baseline. You could be across country um, uh, in New York and San Francisco, as long as you know the distance, um, and you sight an object way off in the distance uh, to use as your uh, source, light source, uh, way off in the distance so you can measure your parallax angles, you don't have to be able to see along the baseline. This is the beauty of using the parallax method. Now, we can, um, this measurement procedure using parallax can be uh, simplified with a simple trick that eliminates the measure uh, the need to measure parallel parallax angle 2. And I'll show you that uh, here in a moment. Now, this is what we had 
is what we are trying to do is determine the distance to this object. These are the lengths L2 and L1 from the observation positions at the end of uh, the baseline. We establish a baseline. This is a known length. And then we go to each end of the baseline and cite the object. Now, in general, we can use as a reference some point of reference way, way out in the distance, much greater than the object, so that we know that the light rays coming to us from that object way off in the distance are essentially parallel, so we can measure these uh, parallax angles with respect to that object way out in the distance. Now, a trick that we're going to use here is we can see that rather than picking uh, some reference point way out someplace, uh, out in the sky or out in the distance, how about if we line up the object that we're trying to find the distance to with something way beyond it, directly in line. So what we're going to do is swing our light rays over so that they are coincident with the object. When we do that, we can see that our theta 2 angle collapses to zero. And that's what we have here, is we have our baseline, our two points of observation at 1 and 2 are to sight the object. Well, here we are at 2, we're sighting the object in line with something way out in the distance so that our theta 2 goes to 0. So in this case, or not theta 2, but our phi 2 goes to 0 in this case. And that being the case, remember that our theta, which is a small angle for an object out in the distance, uh, let's say our angle is going to be uh, less than 5 degrees, we want to make sure that the object is far enough out that we're trying to measure so that this theta is small. And if theta is small, it is equal to our parallax angles, phi1 and phi2. But since we blind the object we're trying to find the di distance to with something way off in the distance, theta2 goes, or phi2 goes to zero. So our angle theta becomes nothing more than the parallax angle phi1. So all we have to do now is just measure one angle. All we have, we know the length of the baseline. We measure the parallax angle with respect to something way in the distance that's in line with the object that we're trying to find the distance to. And this distance, let's call it L to the object, just becomes the baseline length divided by our parallax angle. Very simple arithmetic. No trig functions. We don't have to uh, do any complicated math. All we have to do is ensure that the object that we're trying to cite and determine the distance to is much, much greater than the baseline width or length. So the condition is, is that our baseline is going to be much, much smaller than the distance to the object that we're trying to determine. And our point of reference is another object way beyond our object that we're trying to find the distance to. So we're guaranteed that the light rays coming to us at both ends of the baseline are essentially parallel. That's the trick. Now, let's look at how we can use this, how this is used in astronomical distances, measuring astronomical distances to planets and stars uh, using optical methods. And what comes into play here is an astronomical distance, unit of distance called the parsec. The parsec P-A-R-S-E-C that stands for parallax arc second. So this is a parsec. You've probably heard this term. It's a parallax 
arc second. I'll explain what that means. <clears throat> Parsec is a unit of length. Some sci-fi movies I've seen, uh, they use uh, Parsec as a unit of time. I believe they did that in Star Wars and that. That's incorrect. Parsec is not a unit of time. It's a unit of length. And it stands for Parallax Arc Second. <clears throat> a Parsec is a parallax arc second where we choose a baseline of one astronomical unit. An astronomical unit is the distance that from the Earth to the Sun, which is 149.598 times 10 to the ninth meters, or roughly 150 billion meters is the distance that the Earth is from the Sun, or in miles it comes out to uh, around 93 million miles. Now, our, our triangle that we're solving is that if we have a baseline, say call it S, we called it LB before, this length will choose for our baseline to be one astronomical unit. Then the relationship between the distance from points of observation at the end of the baseline to the object we're trying to determine the distance to, this distance L, the relationship that we came up with is that the baseline is equal to the length times theta, and I put it in here to remind us that theta has to be in radians, or you can rewrite it as that the distance L is just the baseline divided by the angle of measure, which is our parallax angle, uh, the same as our phi 1, which is in radians. So it's the baseline divided by the parallax angle that we measure uh, in radians. Now, one arc second in terms of radians, arc seconds is a degree measure. It's one degree divided by 3,600. There's 60 minutes uh, per degree and 60 arc seconds per minute. So there are 3,600 arc seconds in a degree. So one degree divided by 3,600. We multiply by pi radians in 180 degrees. And we come out to 0 0.48481 times 10 to the minus 6 radians. So one arc second is roughly about one micro or uh, five micro radians. Now, if we choose a baseline of one astronomical unit, which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, let's say this is the Earth, this is the Sun, and we're at the Earth, what is the length L if the parallax angle that we measure from the Earth is one arc second. Well, one arc second is roughly five micro radians. So we take one astronomical unit. We're using this equation here, our baseline divided by our angle theta. So we have one astronomical unit divided by one arc second expressed in radians. So we get the length L that we can cite out to an object that object would be at 206,265 astronomical units. If we measure a parallax angle using a baseline from the distance of the Earth to the Sun of one astronomical unit, and our parallax angle is one arc second, then that object is roughly 206,000 astronomical astronomical units from the Earth, or 206,000 times further than the Earth is from the Sun. Now, let's look, express this in terms of light years. How far is that in light years? Well, a light year distance is just the velocity that light travels uh, per second times the time in seconds. Well, light travels at a speed of 299.79 million meters per second. 
and we multiply the time that uh, we the light travels in one year. Well, one year is 365.25 days times 24 hours per day times 3600 seconds per hour. We have to express our time in seconds because I have the velocity in meters per second. So we get how many meters light has traveled in one year. Well that works out to 9.46065 times 10 to the 15th meters. Uh, so that's uh, roughly, um, or that comes out to 9 thousand four hundred sixty trillion meters nine thousand four hundred sixty trillion meters is the distance light travels in a year which works out to roughly five point eight seven eight uh, six trillion miles so roughly about six trillion miles is the distance that light travels in a year now we have our base uh, from our baseline the distance to an object when we use the baseline as one astronomical unit we know that's 206,000 roughly astronomical units now let's express the light year distance in terms of astronomical units <clears throat> well the light year is 9.46065 times 10 to the 15th meters. But we know that one astronomical unit is 149,000 <coughs> or uh, yeah, 149.598 billion meters. So we divide by 149.598 times 10 to the 9th meters per astronomical unit. So that's the <clears throat> light year expressed in astronomical units and that works out to 63,240.5 astronomical units. So light travels in one year <clears throat> the distance of 63,240 times the distance that the earth is from the sun. So you take the distance from the Earth to the Sun, multiply by a little more than 63,000, and that gives you how far light travels in one year. So if now we take this, our L, 206,265 astronomical units, and divide by 63,240.5, astronomical units in a light year, this comes out to 3.2616 light years. And remember L is one parsec. That is the astronomical unit divided by one arc second expressed in radians. So this is a parsec. One parsec is 3.2616 light years. That's um, the distance out to an object. If you measure using a baseline of one astronomical unit and measure a parallax angle of one arc second, the distance that that object is from you is 3.2616 light years. Now, let's talk about uh, see how far out we can measure with optical uh, methods using the parallax method. The parallax method is, is we're, we're using light to help us determine uh, distances out. Uh, so we're using optical means. How far out can we measure objects out in the heavens using the parallax methods? Now let's calculate how far out with optical means we can sight objects in the heaven. Here I have a depiction of the Earth orbiting about the sun. Now, 
the orbital diameter is two astronomical units. Remember, an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So uh, that's the radius of this circle. So we have one astronomical unit from the Sun to the Earth there. And this is the Earth at position, say, day zero. And then a half a year later, the Earth will be diametrically opposed from where it was when we started making our measurements. So this distance is also one astronomical unit. So the diameter is two astronomical units. So here's the method that we use. We want to measure the distance L from the Earth to, say, some distant star. Now, we line up the star. This is the easy way. We don't have to do it this way, but it makes the uh, math much easier. So what we do is we pick another object way out in the heavens, much, much further away than the star we're trying to determine the distance to. So we have light coming from a distant star, nebula, or something way, way out in the heavens, where the distance to that object is much, much, much greater than the distance we're trying to measure. By invoking that condition, we are guaranteed that the light coming from this distant star or this distant light source is parallel with respect to our two points of observation on the Earth's orbit. We want the distance, the baseline of the Earth's orbit to be considerably smaller than the light source way out in the heavens. That is the condition that we need. And that's easy to do. Remember the um, uh, observer, observable universe is around 15 billion light years. So say if we're trying to measure a distance out uh, to uh, our nearest star is about four light years. Say we want to measure something that might be on the order of 10 light years. If we choose to line it up with some star in the distance out at several hundred uh, light years, then this condition will uh, hold. So we start here at day zero. We sight the object that we want to know the distance to, and we line it up with some distance object way, way much further from the Earth. Then we wait a half a year later when we're on the opposite side of the sun and we look at that star again and we measure the angle, the parallax angle, phi1, that that star makes with respect to that other distant object way, way uh, out in the heavens. Then what we have are two parallel light rays coming from that light source and using the properties of parallel lines with another line intersecting it, if this is angle phi 1, this is also angle phi 1. And so our distance L will be the baseline, which is two astronomical units, divided by phi 1 in radians. Now, uh, I'm not sure exactly where the current state of the art is, but the angular resolution in which we can optically measure with the best uh, telescopes and uh, equipment that we have, I believe um, that phi1 is going to be basically around 0 0.002 uh, arc seconds. Let's just use that number. I think that's around the, uh, around the best that we can do. So in terms of radians, 0 0.002 arc seconds, we divide by 3600 uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to get degrees and then multiply by pi and divide by 180 degrees. So what we're going to do is take, we have one degree is 3600 arc seconds and then we have pi radians per degree and this gives us radians and this works out 0 
arc seconds is 9.696 times 10 to the minus 9th radians, or nine point, roughly 9.7 nanoradians is what 0 0.002 arc seconds is. So if we put that in to here, the radian measure, then L works out to 206 million, 206.265 million astronomical units. And remember, we know that there are um, 3,000 or 63,240.5 astronomical units is a light year. We just computed that. So let's find out what L is in terms of light years. L then would be roughly 206.265 times 10 to the 6 astronomical units and we're dividing by 63,240.5 astronomical units per light year. And this works out to <clears throat> about 3,262 light years. So that's the limit of our capability of getting the distance the distance to objects out in the heavens using optical me methods. And that's at the very resolution. Um, you probably need to back that off by a factor of three or four um, so that your error bars aren't too big. Um, so somewhere around a thousand light years is what we can measure uh, optically to distant objects. Um, beyond that, we have to use other means. Um, like standard candles and other things like that to uh, compute these distances. But anyway, in closing, I just want to uh, comment that our pole star Polaris, the North Star, is about 433 light years uh, distant from the Earth. So we can measure the distance to Polaris using uh, optical means using the parallax method because 433 light years is within the uh, limit of uh, 3,000 light years. So that is possible and there are many, many stars uh, that we can measure using these parallax methods and most certainly all the uh, planets in our solar system. So that ends uh, this particular discussion on parallax and parallax measurement.